and welcome to the Healing Community Study Learning Collaborative. My name is Lisa Romley, and I'm the Education Program Coordinator for the HEAL Study. We are here today to showcase two centers that are really meeting the needs of their community with some great innovative strategies. I just need to review some housekeeping items before we get started. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded today. And if your screen name is not your full name, you're using a partial name or you're using your phone, if you could please update that now to your full name, that just helps when we compare the participants list to the registration list. We are offering CE credits for today's session. One CE credit has been approved for physicians, pharmacists, social workers, nurses, and licensed alcohol and drug counselors. And I'll give you instructions at the end of the session on how to obtain a CE credit. We also offer just a certificate of attendance if for anyone that wants that too. We do ask that you stay on mute when throughout the session when you're not speaking and that just helps reduce the echo and extraneous noises. If you have any questions in today's session, and we do welcome your questions, we really want this to be a very interactive session, please use the raise hand feature, which you'll find on the um, bottom of the screen if you click on reaction and then click on the raised hand. And or you can type your questions in the chat box and I'll read them sometime during the session. Just to announce that um, our all presenters today have said that they do not have any relevant financial relationships to disclose. And the practice gap that we have identified as advocates for recovery support services in their communities often lack understanding of the financial, social service, and labor resources needed to implement these services. The educational needs that we'll be addressing is understand the appropriate resources needed to provide support services for individuals needing support for long term recovery and the unstably housed. And our learning objectives today will be discussing best practices when implementing a center, identifying resources needed and also identifying the examples of activities. Um, to integrate through for these effective um, support services. And then we will also be discussing the various roles and responsibility of staff needed to run these centers. So at the end of the session, hopefully you'll be able to describe the resources and finances needed um, to implement a center that supports the long term recovery and for the un unstably housed. So I am so pleased to welcome our panelists today for today's learning collaborative session. I'm going to have them introduce themselves and just give a brief overview of their background. And if they could share with the group, what led them to working at their community center? So let me start with um, Todd and go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, well, my name's Todd Young, and um, I was the director at the neighborhood from 2015 to uh, fall of 21. And uh, my background is uh, I suffered from substance abuse in the 70s, early 80s. And uh, when I was able to recover from that, I wanted to help uh, actually teenagers at that time uh, really not go through what I had to go through, or if they were stuck in it, how to get out of it. So that kind of led me down the road to, um, you know, at-risk populations and uh, uh, ended up here in Ashland, Kentucky at the neighborhood. Great. Thank you. And go ahead, Jeremy. Well, I was just blessed to meet Todd Young uh, several years ago. My background um, is actually, you know, sports marketing and management and, and ministry. But then um, when COVID hit, I, I, I'd been working with an organization we founded eight years ago called the Big Idea Camp, which does character development in schools. And when COVID hit, there were a lot of less things for me to get involved with our schools. They weren't open. Um, and so I needed to find a place to serve um, and then just knew what Todd was doing at the neighborhood and uh, was just highly attracted to it because I saw the, the needs that the facility met and how the leadership was uh, using their influence in relationships with, with people um, that were in the margins of life, uh, that had needs in poverty uh, and housing um, and stability. And so just was highly attracted to that, started to volunteer there and serve there and turned out just to be something that transitioned into just last fall, 
um, you know, he passed the baton on of, of leadership as the director. So uh, love it day to day. Every day is a challenge. Every day's got multiple juggling problems, but man, it's so worth it when you see people grow and succeed. Yeah, real rewarding. Great. Thank you. And then we have Jeremy Bayard from, I'll let him introduce himself. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Jeremy Bayard from the Louisville Recovery Community Connection. Um, I too was, I kind of came from the private sector. Um, I, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm a person who was formerly incarcerated. And uh, I started giving back at, at a treatment center um, that I went through as a volunteer. And then slowly kind of it worked my way into a job there. Um, they, they kept asking me if I, if I thought I would want a job. And I kind of kept kind of turning them down. And then something told me to just kind of like follow my heart, not my wallet. Um, and and I decided to, to get a job there and, and uh, worked as a part time employee and then and then decided to go full time and then kind of traversed my way through um, through the waters and ended up being able to start the LRCC some years later. Great. Thank you. I'm going to ask the panelists if you could just give a brief history about your center. You know, how did it get started? And um, was there some type of funding to help get this started? You could speak about that a little bit. And anyone can start. Go ahead, uh, Todd, maybe. Um, yeah, so uh, I, when I took over, we were uh, probably six years into our existence. Um, we actually, my position was actually a, an Ameris, uh core VISTA position. And um, uh, I think we had five nonprofits at that time. And how we came into existence when we would give our tours and elevator uh, speech, uh, you know, it's a collaboration between local government, uh, uh, churches, uh, and faith based organizations and concerned citizens in our uh, community. And that's how it, it got started. There were uh, nonprofits started talking to each other. Um, you know, unfortunately they were spread out throughout our city and um, you had to do the same paperwork. You had to tell your story over and over again uh, at every place you went. And they started saying, what if we had a central location for uh, social services kind of like a mall. And uh, like I said, the local government got behind us. We got some CDBG money. Uh, we had a church that uh, gave us uh, a loan that uh, we paid back within the year. And, uh, and then, you know, they started looking at um, location, 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 because transportation is right. so huge an issue for people that are struggling. Um, so that's kind of, uh, I mean, Jeremy, you got anything to add to that? You know, I just think the biggest thing for us was the need and the location of others. So if you guys will see photographs in a little bit, but our facility literally houses eight uh, different nonprofit organizations. We're, we're a mall of charities. And before, if you needed clothing or food or some, you know, utility assistance or some housing needs, you had to travel uh, to one specific place, which was scattered throughout of Ashland. Right. And so it just made more sense to have a collaborative uh, effort. And so um, that, that's what our, the neighborhood actually is. We are a mall of charitable organizations under one roof yeah. uh, so that we can work together to meet the needs and, and get people back uh, into different programming and recovery and stability. Yeah. And we, you know, we have to a central database now. So, um, you know, before you would have been had to fill out paperwork and then, you know, maybe told your story, you know, I've, I've got a young lady that's very close to me uh, to even talk about what's happened to her and what was done to her. Um, uh, still to this day, I met her when she was 12, kind of gives her anxiety. But, you know, back before we did this, you might have, uh, a man might have been asking that young lady, you know, how'd you get here? And she would have lied to him anyway, but just that over and over again, um, you know, is not good for the people that we're trying to help. So we now have a um, charity tracker. Um, you get a card when you come into our facility and you're asked once and then 
Uh, you don't have to fill any of the paperwork back out. You can utilize everything that we've got. Um, and uh, if you're a woman, uh, the woman is asking you questions. Uh, you know, you're not telling your your story or uh, uh, to anybody. You know, uh, we we match males and females up. So, or males and males, females and females up. So, again, it's a uh, one-time deal. And then we know when you're in the building, we track all that stuff, how many services that you, we have been given to you. Um, you know, so we can ask now the appropriate questions. Right. Okay. You know, why, uh, why are we giving, uh, uncle Sid uh, utility assistance for 10 years, <laughs> you know, and maybe it's, we can hook them up with a, um, uh, something like frontier housing or something that comes in and does rehab work and puts proper insulation in the house. So we don't have to give that assistance anymore. So it's, it's helped us to start asking the right questions. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Jeremy Bayard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ironically, that was, that was kind of, um, uh, similar in, in, a, in a way is I was working at, at a treatment center and I was uh, actually kind of heading up the uh, supported employment division at this at this nonprofit and we kept, I kept running into very similar kind of barriers of hey we're, we're having to run from here to here and pe transportation is a huge barrier and we're you know duplicating um, you know uh, all of the same paperwork and and I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a nonprofit mall? That, that was the exact words I used. I just, uh, uh, I lit up when you all said that, um, Jeremy and Todd. And I was in a meeting and, and a woman said, hey, I know of a property downtown that just came available that I think you should look at. And I said, oh, I, 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 it's just an idea. I don't, I, don't, I don't have any money to back this up or anything like that. And she said, why don't you just go look at it, Jeremy? I said, okay, I'll go look at it. And I looked at it and I said, oh, man, this would be a great place to start. Um, and I, I took the idea and I took pictures and I took it back to the, the agency organization that I was working with. And, and they loved the idea. And then, you know, the big question, OK, well, how, how are you going to pay for that? I said, I don't know. I was hoping I was hoping I would just have the idea and you would have the answer to that question. And um, of course, they laughed and. Um, so we kind of just, you know, put it over on the shelf and said, great idea. Let's just keep thinking. And then a couple, a couple weeks later, actually, um, a notice of funding came out um, through the Kentucky Opioid Response Effort for Recovery Community Centers. And um, that, that came across my desk and I said, hey, this might not be a nonprofit mall, but this could be where we kind of start. Um, and we need one of these in our in our community, anyway. And so we wrote for we wrote for a grant, and and I spoke with my you know agency and said, hey, if we write for this, um, this this kind of needs to be independent from from your organization, from our organization. Um, and the idea will be that that we'll write for it and and get a 501c3 you know a separate 501c3 for the community center itself and and it'll be its own entity um that way it can be the communities and not you know attached to the treatment center and they saw the vision said okay and we did that and eventually we did get our own a designation of 501c3 and and what we did was in the in the back we kind of have a, a a little small nonprofit incubator, um, if you will. We we rent offices out to about four or five other organizations right now that are nonprofits that have similar um, missions who are aligned in in the same way, and, and hopefully you know we can we can get some more offices in the building or satellite offices in the future and and be able to eliminate even more barriers. Great. Thank you. Um, and as I go on with the pictures, I do want to st um, stop here and say I have the long name for the Louisville Recovery Center. It's called the Louisville Recovery um, Community Connection. And I apologize to Jeremy and, and making that um, air there. I didn't realize that till sh just a little while ago. So, But I did want to let everybody in the room know that that's what a, the, the correct name. So. 
So a few weeks ago, I got to visit both of these centers and was so impressed with both places and the services that they're offering for their community. And I did take some pictures, so I want to share with the group and have the panelists speak about their services. So let me move to the next slide here. Um, so accessing your center, um, it sometimes is a, I wanted to know, and I'm sure the group does here too, is, is there a registration process? Do you track that? And um, of like, who's using your services and what they're using them for? Um, how, do they, how do they know about your center? Is there some type of advertisement or is it word of mouth? And um, so if you could speak to those questions and we could start with the neighborhood, how, how does that process work? So I like, you know, the, the piece of paper that you have there, we, we are very um, strategic on a few things. And so that neighborhood card, it is a, it's an identification card. I mean, it's not a state ID card, but it, but as a local matter of fact, our local bus stops now actually use that for one of their cards. Um, so the neighborhood cards, picture ID, and they've got to have some proof of ID to get that card. But one of our main uh, nonprofits in our, our facility cares, Community Assistance Referral Services, helps you get uh, your ID cards if you need it. And one of the reasons why we really want you to have these cards. Now, first of all, we will give you every service you ever need if you don't have that card. So it's not you have to have it. We just want you to have it. Um, and we'll do that free services for 30 days for sure, even without that card. But we've actually found that just keeping this card is one way to promote some accountability. Um, it, is, it is definitely a way uh, you know, to say, hey, we want you to be responsible and this is just a simple way of doing it. But on the backside for us, it helps us be accountable. It helps us track things. I know right now that in 2021, we had 31,000 people check into the facility over the year. Uh, and of those 31,000 people, we can track how many services and it was over um, 38,000 different services provided, anything from clothing to showers to haircuts uh, to utility assistance, um, all the things that are offered in our facility, but we can track that. And tracking that helps us find out financially where are we spending our money? Um, because we get a lot of shirts, uh, sweatshirts, blankets donated, but what we don't get donated is, is socks and underwear, obviously. I don't know about wearing used underwear, not a big fan of that idea, but we'll spend money on it and we'll see, okay, well, we spent this much money on sweaters. Maybe we don't need to do that because we're getting so many donated. And so this card, what happens when they have it, when they go to say the dressing room or clothing closet, it's they bar barcode it, they scan the card and scan what assistance they're getting. So that way we can Excel sheet it, document it, find out what's coming in, what's going out, what we may need to track more of. And it's the same way with our kitchen, um, same way with our uh, referral assistances. And so this card has just been um, a proper way to measure. And uh, it, it's hard to set goals and obtain goals if you have no legit way of measuring. And so it's been good for us and it's been just good for the clients. Mm -hmm. Again, helps us ask the right questions. Um, I can speak to the socks and underwear when I was there. Uh, we were spending a lot of money, but we were also seeing that we had clients that we'd gotten housed. And why am I giving this certain client brand new underwear and socks every week and also handing them a box of Tide or whatever? Um, and, you know, we, we were able to tell that person, can you wash your socks and underwear in the bathtub? And uh, with the, you know, uh, the detergent we're giving, he goes, oh, I never thought of that, you know. Uh, and then it also showed us uh, we hooked up with Walmart and now we don't buy socks and underwear because uh, it's a nonprofit uh, organization that they work with. And um, we haven't bought socks and underwear in, in several years. Uh, so, it, it, again, it just shows that uh, helped us uh, see the data that we needed to see to ask. Yeah, there's a really good question. Stephanie Owen asked, do you get any client pushback or hesitancy with the tracking system? It, it, the other thing that I didn't even address, I probably even should have, is when you measure things, you can apply for grants with your data. And so we are capable of giving what we give because we can show our partners and our sponsors, this is the need. And so, you know, I, I don't think we really have any pushback from the clients. I, I think they just, they have the appreciation of it. Um, and, I, and I will tell you this, we actually have policies now that 
if you lose your card? What do you do if you lose your card? So, I mean, there is a price on the card, not to the clients, but we do pay to have the card maker, the, the card stock itself. And so what we ask is, hey, if you lose your card in, in, you know, in a year's time, you have 30 days and the price to get a new card is actually you have to volunteer two hours at one of the agencies here. And that may be in the kitchen, that may be helping sort clothes at the dressing room. Um, but I would say that maybe if, if there is a pushback, it is a, oh man, you got to make me work here. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, because because in 2021, we gave three point five million dollars of services out. And so we need to make sure that we, we have that working relationship. So that's about the only uh, pushback that I know we get. And we and again, it helps us add accountability in. So mm -hmm. if you don't have your IDs, you don't have we we give you four weeks uh, to accomplish that. If you come back in the fourth week and you've done four of the five things we ask you to do, we extend that temporary card. But if you've done nothing, um, we don't give you that card. And then we do refuse services. And again, it's just adding that dignity and that accountability. And then we high five them when they get it done, yeah. you know. Uh, but, you know, we, we really try to, to get people to be accountable for what we're asking them to do. Um, and that goes a long way when they yeah. start to get, you know, go for employment. I will tell you, too, that most of our, our card, if you don't have your ID, a lot of the places that hire the, the clients that we work with will accept our ID card because they realize we have all that. We have, you know, better data than. <laughs> and uh, so they'll accept that and get them hired with that, knowing that we are working to get their driver's license or state ID or whatever they need for tax purposes for the employer. Uh, so it's been good for the whole community. That's great. Um, another a question came in and it came in more directly just to me. So what do you use a particular software to, for your tracking at all? Yeah, um, it's called Charity Tracker uh, is actually the name of the company, Charity Tracker. And it is it's very customizable. You can set your parameters for what services are provided, what data you want to uh, obtain. Uh, matter of fact, it's getting to the point now where if there's something happening locally with police officers, they come to us. Hey, what information can you give to us about these people? Where can we help find them? Or now we're trying to work with even with our uh, our, our local coroner. He said, can you help track the next of kin, uh, which is something we haven't been doing. And so that was a recommendation just from our local elected officials of can you help us with that just in case? Uh, yeah. which I thought that was a pretty, pretty good idea. And, uh, you know, it's a barcode system. It was really, I mean, we're like every other nonprofit. We, you know, finances are tough, but uh, the barcoders were a hundred bucks. Uh, you check in when you come into the building. COVID kind of forced that. I, I worked for three or four years to try to get a receptionist, kind of like in the mall, you are here. And we've got that now. We were able to hire to that, but they barcode the card when they come in, uh, we, so we know exactly who's in the building. Um, and like Jeremy said, we we get calls from the state eye patrol asking for missing persons, and we can say, yeah, you know, uh, Jeremy was in the building three days ago. He got a hooded sweatshirt and he ate breakfast, but we haven't seen him since then. So that's just how good a data we have. That's awesome. Yeah. Jeremy, how about the LRCC? Yeah, um, so we do have a, a formal kind of intake system. Um, we have a kiosk when you walk in that that you can kind of self-service or, the, you know, there's a receptionist there that will, will help you kind of navigate the system. It can also be um, utilized from an organization, you know, you know, digitally uh, over the over the web. So it's a cloud based system. Um, called Recovery Link. And so if anybody's doing a referral from across town or wants to do a self-referral from their phone, from their tablet, from their computer, anywhere that they have access to the internet, they can, they can do a self-referral or somebody can refer somebody from another agency um, just through our kiosk portal. And we do give that information out to, you know, different agencies that, that are in the area that work, you know, whether that's recovery residences, whether that's, you know, detox or residential programs, transitional living, um, uh, you know, the, the shelters, different places all have, you know, a flyer with, with that information to where they can get, get onto our kiosk um, you know, portal and, and, and get people in and do a brief intake. And then from there, that, that system will send uh, our supervisors 
uh, an email and let somebody know that somebody's in the system and then they can they can, uh, you know, call that person, set up an appointment or that person can just drop in. Anybody can just drop in during our drop in hours. Um, but 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 before they come in, they'll do a brief intake and then they'll be kind of navigated to the appropriate staff, um, depending on what kind of services they want or need at the time. Or if they're just there to use the computer lab or just there to kind of charge their phone and have a safe space or just just need someone to talk to for a moment or just kind of get out of the elements. Um, they're 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 able to do that, too, but they do get into the system. And then from there, they're also able to have their own participant profile to where they are our, our system is kind of it's called a we call it a an ERR an electronic recovery record so there's all kinds of you know bark 10 the brief assessment of recovery capital assessment that's built in there the eight dimensions of wellness um, the recovery planning and goal setting and all the referrals and everything is kind of is kept longitudinal historical data. So everything is up to date and that person has their own participant profile that they can get into um, once they've verified an email address, if they have an email address. If they don't have an email address, we can set them up with one. Um, but then they can they can remote anywhere that they have access to, you know, the internet. Um, from their phone, tablet, or, or or computer, they can they can get in and see their goals, and, and it's, we have data transparency in, in that in that regard. Of it's your data, uh, not ours. Um, and a lot of times, people need that for recovery court or need some of you know need some proof for their PO or you know their parole officer, probation officer, or other services they might be you know receiving elsewhere in the city or state. Um, and so they have access to everything they have, or they might just say, "Hey, I want to. I, I can't remember uh, what what the what my uh, what some of those tasks were on my smart goals for my for for some of the goals that I set last time." And instead of trying to carry around a piece of paper, uh, we do live in a digital age, and, and a lot of people do have access to that. And some don't, um, and and we will, you know, obviously print off papers for individuals, or there are some individuals that opt out of having that kind of per participant portal, but um, that's one way that we kind of stay connected. And, and we do advertise, um, you know, have a little bit of a presence on social media, um, get out there boots on the ground. We, we do have some mobile units that go out into the community, whether that's, you know, help supporting the, the syringe exchange programs or going into the 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 um, houseless encampments throughout town or, or just popping up in kind of the um you know, um, different neighborhoods that, that we service, um, we will get word of mouth out that way or, or get, you know, flyers out that way. But word of mouth is our biggest, our, our, our biggest kind of, uh, in catchment, if you will, a lot of, a lot of people just, Hey, you should go to the LRCC or have you talked to Jeremy or have you, you know, and, and so I, I will say that word of mouth, um, you know, travels fast in, in the encampments and in the communities when, when someone gets a need met and gets a need met. Uh, I think there's been so much silo, uh, siloism, if you will, in, in, in these in these kind of spaces for so long or, or um, that when people see something working efficiently or get a need met very quickly, um, word of mouth travels very fast. Hey, yeah. you can you can get this here. You can do that there. And no, there it's, it's no barrier. They're 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 really nice over there. The things like that um, really get the get the the word traveling pretty fast. Yeah, that's great. Um, a question came in the chat box here. Do you like update your questions in that registration process at all? Or um... yeah. And so that, that's a great question. You know, if there's several agencies, this, this is why it's so important. Since there are several agencies that use this same data tracking, uh, at what point do you get all the information from the participants and how often do you update the questions so they're what the agencies need and nothing else? Seven of eight of the agencies that utilize our facility are, are more what I would call stability giving uh, resources, food, clothing, uh, showers, um, haircuts, uh, and assistance like that, whereas we have one that that goes a lot deeper where they get the identification cards, your birth certificate, mm -hmm. uh, or even um, caseworkers, you know, that they they have multiple schedules with and uh, utility assistance, and that's CARES. They go a lot deeper 
in the program that we use, CARES obviously goes layers and layers and layers deeper. They have lockable folders and password protected from their login that the other agencies don't. Um, and then they have software themselves for their record keeping. We have to have firewall protections. It's a HIPAA, it's a HIPAA law. Uh, so we have to have firewall protection just for their agency at our facility. Um, so not everybody has access to the data from that specific uh, agency because of, of the questions they need to ask. To be honest, the people that are handing out the, the clothing and the showers, their job isn't to know all that deep detail. Their, their, their job is to, hey, we love you. I don't care how messy or dirty you are. Come in, use what you need, and we're going to give you what you need and pat you on the back and say thanks for being here. Yeah. And the cards are updated annually by the clients. They know when to come in. Um, so yeah. that's that's another uh, thing. And I want you guys to understand when when I started in 15, um, I saw clipboards, we were still tracking and we had charity tracker, uh, cares ran it, but we would have them sign in it for dinner, or we would have them sign in for a shower. And there was personal information on clipboards that none of us in this call would ever put down. Uh, and then it went over to my great volunteers, but they were all elderly ladies that, and uh, when I got there, we had floppy disks still, okay? <laughs> and um, and then we were six or eight months behind on data entry, uh, and it wasn't accurate. And people were saying, well, we're just going to skip those three months. Uh, charity trackers, when I left, was around $365 a year for like the top of the line. And what we tried, what I started doing was getting other like uh, like the food bank at the uh, uh, House of Grace Church, um, they were they wanted to start tracking people. So we paid for charity tracker there. Uh, Shelter of Hope had charity tracker. So again, and I tried to get like other missions and stuff to buy into it because if you were two miles across the um, uh, city, and uh, I had all your data, and you had Charity Tracker, you could access that. I could allow you to access that to print off their Social Security card or whatever it was, you know, that you needed. Uh, uh, it just it just streamlined things yeah. for not only us, but the clients. Sure. Um, and, you know, that's who we're interested in. It's great. And Jeremy, do you have anything to add with the LRCC in regards to that question about information or changing questions at all? Um, yeah, we. I mean, we have the ability to change um, change questions and kind of customize some things on the back end as far as questions go. But um, yeah, our system. Yeah, our system. It, it was. It's built. You know, for recovery. Um, you know, um, supports and, and it was built by people in recovery and by people who started recovery community organizations. So with really looking at uh, what we what we ask and what we track, um, you know, there's some things that I think intuitively our coaches and our, 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 our supervisors kind of might ask in a session, but there's usually a place to to capture that, whether in narrative or some sort of kind of drop down or other box. So a lot of the things that we ask that we need um, for any kind of you know data reporting or for just for our own needs for referrals and, and things of that nature is it, kind of it's baked in the sauce there somewhere. We collect, I mean, we have the ability to collect about 1,800 different data points um, in our system. It's just a matter of where where it goes but on the on the initial intake uh occasionally we ask we we did add a couple of components um recently that we weren't that we weren't asking about some uh like criminal justice involvement um we wanted to start asking about that from from the get-go that way we could you know get people to maybe uh a more appropriate uh coach or, or team member but um yeah we, we do have the ability to do that but most of the time for the intake purposes, we, we, we know what we're going to need and we know what, what other agencies are going to need for referrals. And so um, it, it's for the most part stayed the same. Like I said, we've added a couple questions here and there. We did add, you know, some different COVID questions and consent questions there at the beginning uh, of our intake that are now just 
standard. Hopefully we can take <laughs> the COVID questions off here sometime soon, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm quarantined right now with COVID. So we're still going to be asking them. <laughs> All right. Well, let me move on here to the um, LRCC um, in your kind of your lobby area as soon as you walk in you see this big calendar of all these activities so uh jeremy can you explain how um all the activities and the meetings and the recovery coaching you know all those that you do throughout the uh, month um that you host at your center um sure and i'm probably gonna forget a whole host of them um <laughs> we do we su we support you know about I think there's about 17, you know, support group mutual aid meetings that happen on a, on a weekly basis. Um, and that ranges from, uh, you know, AA meetings to, you know, sex and love addiction, anonymous meetings to um, all, all the different mutual aid. There's just, you know, MARA, uh, Medicaid, Medicaid Assisted Recovery Anonymous, um, there's, you know, harm reduction works, harm reduction, you know, that's a harm reduction lens, you know, there's smart recovery meetings that happen, just a whole host of, of different type of uh, mutual aid meetings that go on. And we do have the one-on-one -on -one, uh, recovery coaching. Um, we, we've kicked back up now that, that some of the COVID restrictions have, have started to kind of loosen. We are, we are starting to do um, more of our like have some art activities that we do or we're bringing local artists who will who will come in and volunteer their time or or sometimes um, we're even able to you know pay them a, a, an honorarium if we can and and get them to come in and and do an art activity and somehow tie that into some sort of recovery theme um, we, we allow uh, multiple agencies to come in and use our boardroom or our training room um, you know, people host their, their own board meetings there or, or, or different kind of committee meetings. There's, and that kind of varies uh, week to week, month to month, depending on um, what, what community needs. Um, and then sometimes people will say, Hey, can we, can we host the, you know, my kid's birthday party? We don't have, uh, we can't find a place or the places are way too expensive. And, uh, oftentimes those are people in recovery that have utilized the center for, for one thing or another, or sometimes uh, they're not always in recovery. Uh, but what we do know is we, we open our doors and we say yes a lot. And we know that um, mental illness and, and addiction and recovery have touched just about every, uh, every life, every person in Kentucky one way or another, probably in this nation one way or another, indirectly or directly. And so um, being able to build that relationship that's that's part of that's part of you know our strategic plan or our you know mission is is to build relationships and from those relationships we know um, that that a lot of other things will follow and so just being able to build those relationships and allow people to come in and utilize our space um, and most of the time utilize it for free is is a big uh, part of what we do, and so there's there's a whole host of of things, you know, open mic nights, um, you know, um, you know, life skills groups. Um, we we partner, we try to partner with other organizations and and have them, you know, if if they do something, uh, would you, would you like to do it over here? Kentucky Anna Works, you know, they have they have a, a, a nice resume building uh, workshop that they do, and then they also you know, do some soft skills groups and, and plug people into to employment. And so they come over once a week um, and we'll work with individuals every Tuesday afternoon. And then from there, they'll set up an appointment with one of our coaches to enhance their resume or, or continue that job search or we'll work on how are we going to get you to these job interviews, whether it's us getting you bus passes or getting you set up with, with some uh, other form of transportation. Um, but there's, yeah, just a whole, whole host of, of different activities that go on on a daily there. Um, that's awesome. I can, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, because that's true, the true meaning of a community center, meeting the needs of the community and what they need. So that, that is so impressive. And um, when I visited both of the centers, I noticed that both of you have billiards table um, in your gathering space area. 
besides being an activity that people just enjoy doing, um, what, what is the benefit of having, you know, a, a pool table? And um, go ahead, the neighborhood, you could start. So that, that pool table, which I'm going to be honest, I'm a little bit more jealous of, of Jeremy's because <laughs> that looks like an upscale hotel that I yeah. want to stay at. Uh, ours is a part of our Taylord program, uh, and that's through Pathways. And so ours is in a center specifically for 14 to 26-year-olds. Um, it is a place to belong, a place to be encouraged. They have sp specific caseworkers just for that age, and it's, it's specific. I, but you know, he just said something earlier that reminded me about if you want to see change, if you want to see healing, if you want to see growth, the truth is it takes an investment of relationship first. It can't just be formal here. Listen, here's your book. Read it. Good luck. Pat you on the butt. Good game out the door. No, it has to be um, invested. And I was, I was thinking not a lot of people read the back of a box of toothpaste. This is a weird analogy, but I use it with my 10 year old on the box of toothpaste on the very back. You have an active ingredient and inactive ingredient. The active ingredient in toothpaste, we all know this because we're all scared of the dentist is fluoride, but the truth is fluoride tastes terrible. So the inactive ingredient is the bubblegum flavor. It takes the bubblegum flavor to get my 10 year old to have toothpaste in his mouth for three minutes. The active ingredient in growth is, is, is the effort. It's, 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 it's what it takes for, for healing. The inactive is relationships. We have to have those relationships for the growth to happen. And so what do you do? You wanna throw around some conversational opportunities. So that's why pool tables matter. That's mm -hmm. why TV screens matter. That's why you want to make a living room setting because that's where the talks happen. It can't just be so formal that it feels like they're at a doctor's appointment when they walk through the door. Um, and that's, again, I would love to sneak around my building and hide from meetings and play pool. As a matter of fact, I try it often, um, but I love it. I, again, I look at theirs and I'm thinking, gee, golly, wow, I'd love to be right there. Um, but yeah, that, that's for us. A pool table, as fun as it is, it is a purpose tool for engagement. Yeah. Right, right. That's great. And and Jeremy at the LRCC? Yeah, I mean, that was a beautiful analogy, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that. That's what it is. It's, it's uh, you know, being a, a retired hairstylist and barber, I, I, I say that's our, that's kind of like our barbershop talks. Like, people congregate around the pool table um, or every once in a while there might be somebody that's just kind of over by them by their lonesome and me or somebody else you know will kind of pick up on that and say hey you want to shoot a game of pool and in this person might have been coming in but but very kind of shy or or who knows what's going on with that individual and and, and oftentimes around that pool table that's where some trust and, and camaraderie is built and those conversations happen um it, it also is is good for um you know oftentimes people bring in kids or teenagers with them um because we are family friendly and so um it, it's it's another activity for hey why don't you go shoot a game of pool with with you know while while mom or dad you know speaks with with someone or or what have you and so it's 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 also you know family friendly in that in that regard and then you know before and after the meetings uh, a lot of the mutual aid meetings there's there's usually a group of fellas or, or even some ladies that, that love to shoot pool and will will come in before or after a meeting and um, you know, they'll, they'll help clean up and they'll help make coffee and they'll help do those things. But they also, you know, come and like, Hey, we want to come early and shoot a couple games of pool before the meeting. And, um, so it, it has, you know, multi-purpose there, uh, at, at the LRCC and, you know, it's, it's also a good, uh, it's a, it's good for us employees every once in a while. I, I, I might not play a full game, but there's, there's times where uh, I'll go uh, rack the balls and, and break them up really, really, uh, <laughs> really, really hard and uh, get a, get a little energy shift there and, and shoot a couple, you know, and just kind of just get a break for a second. Um, mm -hmm. So, so employees get to use it. Um, you know, kids get to use it and, and, and really, really some, uh, some really fruitful conversations have yep. taken place around that pool table. It's almost, it's almost like sacred ground, <laughs> if you will. 
Yeah, thank you. I, in fact, when I was visiting at the LRCC, I was speaking with one of the um, peer support specialists, and she said this is a great way to engage conversation because they're not ready for that direct eye contact. So you're playing an activity that's a great way to start a conversation. I thought, what a how useful that is too, and what a benefit to so many people. Right. So um, Jeremy, you also at the neighborhood have some services for those that are food insecure. Um, tell us about the uh, River City Harvest and the Ashland Community Kitchen. Sure, so River City's Harvest, uh, food recycling, if you will, uh, food that is has an expiration date from Walmart, Kroger, multiple stores in our region, uh, we'll send out box trucks and bring it back to River City's Harvest weigh it, uh, weigh it by its category. Is it dairy? Is it produce? Is it meat? Is it, you know, even if beverages, they all have shelf lives in bakery. And so what they do, they weigh it uh, in their individual uh, categories. And then we have right now 33 different local food pantries um, that we divide it evenly amongst those food pantries and send it back out to those. Um, I don't know what the specific date is for uh, how many days it has left when we get it. I don't know if we get it after. I don't think we get it after it expires. It's still got shelf life mm -hmm. that they give it to us. Um, but then we get out to the food pantries and they give it out that day. Uh, so really River City's Harvest is a very in intentional hub um, to get in food and then get it out the same day, which is very magical. 2020, they did over a million pounds of food. And I know last year is right over 800,000 in 2021. Um, whereas on the flip, and let me just say this, they don't really have day-to-day -day interactions with clients at our facility as much as they do with the, the external food pantries and, uh, you know, facing hunger. Yeah. Oh, and let me stop you right there. Just another thing about Charity Tracker is we assign our clients uh, food pantries that are located in their area where they live. So it does a couple things. Uh, it doesn't overwhelm the food pantry that maybe, you know, the older ladies at the church are cooking uh, homemade cookies and everybody wants to go there. So you're assigned a food pantry in your area. And we, we track all that again through Charity Tracker. Um, so it evens things out and, you know, uh, helps us just track our population and where they're living too. So, and then the Ashland Community Kitchen is the, is the flip side. That is our soup kitchen, if you will. Uh, very rarely do we have soup, but I mean, with three meals a day, Monday through Friday, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and, and that, I mean, I, I'm just going to be honest. It, it's got warmer in the last two weeks. I noticed yesterday a hundred people for breakfast. It, 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 it shocked me. Normally, you know, you can see an easy 30, but when I saw a hundred people there and again, our in Bowie County, Kentucky, we only have 45,000 people in our County. Uh, and to see that, that numbers, you know, it's transient time. You know, first the summer and the fall, fall, we're going to see a lot of people coming in and out. But uh, Ashley Community Kitchen does an extremely incredible job uh, providing meals, daily meals. Um, and so that's 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 the difference of the two. Yeah. And do, and at Ashland Community Kitchen, they sit down, right? And eat, yeah, it's a full right? cafe. Yeah. I mean, that's think of a school lunch. You walk through, you get your tray, sit down, then go put it in the cleaning department, right. the tray yeah. return. And anyone can come from the community. You don't like chat. Yeah. yeah, right. None of our services are geared toward um, finance. So anybody can come and use our facility. Um, uh, you know, you could come in and get a card and use all the, all the um, services offered there. Okay. And can someone come up to the River City Harvest, like an individual, and, and get some groceries? Or how does that work? No, no, okay. no, they have to be registered through the, the Facing Hunger program. Okay. okay. Uh, I will say that in a partnership, Ashland Community Kitchen does have a food pantry there on site. Okay. And one of the things that we do strategically there, uh, they will make emergency food boxes. Mm -hmm. And so if there is a family you note, know, for example, we'll partner with the American Red Cross. If there is a house that burns down or a family just in that emergency scenario, mm -hmm. we can get you covered for a day to three days no question, uh, but but it's not uh, neither. Well, the River City Harvest is definitely not a place just for individual, uh, you know, services compared to food pantry as a whole. And the local local faith based organizations will call us because they'll know people that 
you know, had something happen or they've got a family that just come in and, um, you know, again, we, uh, you don't come and not get what you've come for right, right. <laughs> at, at the neighborhood. So, um, that's great. And to keep that uh, kitchen going, the Ashland kitchen, do, are they, do they receive grant funding or how do they, um, keep that going? All right. So let's get in the fun part too. This is, this is the not so pretty part because, we could sell you on this, but the truth is we have eight organizations in our facility, but they're eight separate organizations, eight different nonprofit organizations with that, boards, with boards, with measurable goals, uh, with direction, with vision of their own. And so we, yeah, we do work together, um, but then, you know, they go for grants. And I think the harder part of that too is the other seven are probably going for the same grant money because we're such a small community. Um, so that, yes, they do get uh, a lot of help. And I think anytime with food, the food seems to be doing great. River City's Harvest and Community Kitchen, as far as getting the larger uh, charitable donations and even grants from our city organizations as well. Um, but yeah, the, everyone, that's, and that's the part. If, if everyone in this room, you know, that's watching this thing, if you're a part of an organization, you know how competitive uh, it is in this world to get good grants. So you want a good grant writer. So, and I'll give you, for instance, then COVID, cause I was still there, um, uh, between the two that we see and river cities harvest was initially started by an Ashland oil citizen that was concerned because they wanted to feed the community kitchen, which, uh, act when I ran the kitchen too, uh, we were their biggest client, so to speak. So it, the, we got food in and it come right across the hallway to me. Now, some dynamics have changed there a little bit. Um, but uh, during COVID, both of these organizations, within a, just a few months, they were overflowing with, we couldn't get rid of the food. And they were um, monetarily had received about $100,000 each. And then I had a... a, a uh, business that I uh, dealt with, a company I dealt with and built relations, and they called me and wanted to give a substantial amount of money uh, to the kitchen in River City's Harvest. And I said, hey, I went to the directors. I said, you guys are busting at the seam. Can I get this for operations? Because we were, we were tanking. You know, all the, uh, our volunteers quit for Marathon and the big hospitals. We, we, uh, and we needed it for operations. Unfortunately, this two companies said, you know, we never thought of that. We're going to send you the money, do with it what you want to do. Oh, so uh, those are some of the struggles that you run in with. If we, if I started the neighborhood right now, I would, I would put it under one umbrella oh. and uh, uh, one board, you could make decisions faster. Um, and uh, Jeremy spoke to it earlier about silos. It's really easy to get the wrong person in there that doesn't see the big picture where silos are start to be built. Um, so that's a constant struggle for the neighborhood. Yeah, interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, also at the neighborhood, you know that people with substance use disorders and those unstably housed really are at risk. You know, for losing their sense of dignity. And you've got services here that maintain and build that sense of dig dignity. Um, talk about your shower, barber, and dressing room services. How so does the, that the, work? Great. The picture on the left and the picture in the middle, that is our Clean Start initiative. Uh, so they have showers, um, the, the barber station, the, the beauty shop. Bar, the director is actually a licensed beautician. Her name's Anna. She does a great job. Uh, and another part of this is, and I think maybe there's a picture in a little bit, but is, but is mailboxes. Um, we give mm -hmm. yeah. temporary uh, mailboxes, which again, let's get back to this uh, and we'll, we'll connect it together. What is our goal for our clients? And for me, the ultimate measure of success is how many people don't have to come back? Yeah. How many people can we move to a healthier position in life? And so now this is why some of the agencies exist. So if we can get you nice, you know, clean, have some, put some dignity back into this thing we call charity, clean, get you some clothes, uh, give you an address because a lot of parts of applications is where can we mail to you? And so now we're gonna give you a place for that to go some clothing, maybe even we have suits uh, and, and nice, you know, business attire. Now you're ready. 
for a job interview. And I, that, that to me is, that's the health of it. Doesn't look sexy on a grant application when your numbers go down. A lot of agencies are, well, we serve this many people, this many meals. We want the biggest numbers ever. To me, that's actually not what I want. I want to see our numbers to drop because we've helped them get to where they can self-sustain, be healthy in that atmosphere. And so, again, I measure success by how many people do we help not have to come back rather than, you know, Todd introduced me uh, two years ago to the book called Toxic Charity. If you give once, they appreciate it. Give twice, they start to anticipate it, start to expect it. And by the fifth time of giving the same service over and over, they, they are now dependent. I've watched people walk into our facility with their heads up and chins up saying, this is incredible. Look at everything you guys do. Wow, wow, wow. And a month later, when they're coming back every two days, their, their eyes are now looking at the floor because they are ashamed that they have to be there. And I hate that. Yeah. I hate it. I, we, sometimes when you give so much, you actually take dignity. And I, I think there's just a different way of doing charity to where there's no upper levels. It's we're just going to walk beside you as you get healthy. And that's what we're here to do. We can find out ways to get you what you need with the shower, with the haircut, with clothing, with food. But man, we are going to celebrate when you win and we're going to be your biggest cheerleaders. I don't want you here because you need our quote unquote product. I want you here because we're getting better as people and healthier. Yeah. I took a picture of uh, Jeremy's LRCC right by probably behind the reception desk, which is setting engage, encourage, and empower. And to me, there's flow to that. And we kind of look at it like uh, 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 like a triage, a hospital, and recovery. So if you look at both of those statements, you're, you know, in triage, you're only spend a little bit of time there and you're moving to the hospital. And depending where you're at, how much you need that hospital, but you're not going to live at the hospital either. And then, you know, to move it out into rehab. So now you're being empowered and we're just kind of pushing you because you're healed now. Uh, you've gotten through this and that we, we want to flow like a river, not for them to come and here's the swamp. And this is where you're going to stay the rest of your life. Uh, so that's kind of how that's uh, our focus for the neighborhood as this is a tool to move you, not to keep you. Yep. Great analogy there. That's wonderful. Um, great services. I uh, um, was really impressed that you're able to offer that. At the um, LRCC, Jeremy, you have a number of meeting spaces that I think are uniquely meeting the needs of individuals and particular sessions. Can you talk about these spaces and what you offer to community members? Yeah, sure. Um, so that first space you see on the left is, um, you know, our, our meditation room. And so there are, you know, there's some meetings that take place in there, um, you know, sometimes that looks like one-on-one -on -one meetings with, you know, sponsee, sponsor relationships, a lot of uh, people that, that are, that are, uh, you know, have some sort of working knowledge of 12-step recovery, a lot of, a lot of fourth and fifth steps um, get, get, um, you know, performed, if you will, in, in that, in that um, area. And that's where individuals kind of do a, a, an inventory of themselves and, um, and then kind of, you know, tell that to another person. Um, and so that, that's kind of a, a sacred process in 12 step recovery. And so, so that room there is, has heard a lot of, a lot of people's secrets that they thought they were taken to the grave, but, but you know through the through recovery have have seen fit to to air those in, in that room with with their sponsor and and their higher power if you will and so uh we also have like dharma recovery is going to be restarting here in june i believe um their meetings in there where that's a a buddhist kind of centric recovery support group meeting that happens in there and we'll do um, you know, meditation groups in there, sometimes impromptu, sometimes scheduled, and then uh, individuals sometimes just want to go back there and, and take a break. And, and um, you know, they can't sleep in there, obviously, um, we'll, we'll we monitor that, but they can go in there and they can meditate or they can just kind of have a quiet place that, that's, that they, they can just kind of collect their thoughts or or, you know, sometimes there's people that go in there and uh, we have some musicians that 
that um, want to come and just have a private place to play their guitar or play their harmonica um, or, or what have you. And so they'll go back there and, and that's their form of meditation. And, and then that's and that's OK. Um, in the middle there, that's the one. That's our training room. Um, you know, we have a couple whiteboards and the TV there and, um, you know, those tables uh, will will move around and you can configure the room however you want. I mean, the, the room gets configured in, in many different ways. Sometimes that room turns into a yoga studio. Sometimes it's an art studio. Sometimes it is training, um, you know, uh, and sometimes it, it, it even turns into a uh, buffet line because uh, that sits behind our kind of living room, which is next to our kitchen. And so sometimes that's that's the workflow, if you will, of, of some of the events that we might have. Um, it's It's been a mocktail bar room uh, setting before. Um, yeah, a, a multi-purpose a training room there. Um, but but yeah, other agencies come in and use that uh, for, for training. You know, Hazelden and Betty Ford's been in there and train, you know, different clinicians, peers, different things like that. Um, other organizations come in and, and will just utilize that as a, as a board room area or, or a training area for their, for their employees, do a team building exercise throughout, you know, throughout our various rooms and things of that nature. And then uh, that last room, you see that that's our boardroom. Um, and so a lot of, a lot of individuals will, we use that for trainings too, as well. And, on the other side, there is, um, you know, glass walls that that have kind of uh, uh, frosting on them that they kind of a a that that it's it's privacy from when when people walk into the center they don't see straight into the boardroom but b uh, they're big whiteboards as well so um, you know we use that for a lot of our trainings and we can you know, tap in, uh, you know, digitally to with that um, TV on the wall. And we have speakers and microphones that we can have in the middle of the boardroom there. And, and so everyone can hear and, and, and speak to uh, anyone that's on Zoom or digitally. And a lot of support group meetings that are maybe smaller support group meetings will meet in there or there might be some private meetings. There's some you know, uh, LGBTQIA meetings uh, and, and the sex and love addiction anonymous meetings that, that want a little bit more privacy and a little bit more intimacy, um, they will meet in, in this room um, as well. Um, and then, then we have our team meetings in there as well. Um, it, it's it, Right now, well, until yesterday, we finally got our kids room, our kids zone uh remodeled from a water damage that had happened uh that that was a, a makeshift kids room for a while as well um we're very adaptable <laughs> the, the lrcc um we we kind of you know what, whatever whatever is needed for that day we will we will kind of you know turn turn different rooms into different different um different spaces as needed great so Great that the way you're meeting the needs of the community is awesome. And then also, um, let me get, whoops. And you I really also, like, oh, oh no, sorry, I was just going to say before I forgot, uh, you know, I really liked what, what Jeremy and Todd were talking about earlier is like something that I kind of tell people in, in training and I remind people throughout our team meetings um, that our job is to work ourselves out of a job Amen. with individuals, right? So m moving from, you know, moving to a self-sustaining, you know, uh, you know, model with individuals, you know, um, they, they do need our help now. Everyone needs help. Um, but, but that's our job is to work ourselves out of a job. And, and it's, and it's just so great when people come back, um, you know, when you haven't seen somebody for a while that you've, that you've been helping for a while, um, there's there's always a man I wonder wonder what's going on right now but then they they pop in and and we're always glad to see them no matter what's what's happened but um it's it's, it's just so great when they say hey that you know got that job that that you know you all helped me get and from there I've gotten Bob you know the list yeah. of things that have happened in their life and uh so it's great you know just trying to work ourselves out of a job so to speak rewarding for sure yeah yeah and then you also have this um, place that's called um, Innovation Station. What what do you do here with the computer and printer, and how does that benefit people? Yeah, so we have those two rooms there, and and now they have uh, uh, they have much more art on the wall now. Um, 
<laughs> that was something we've been we were we were working on getting some walls painted and getting some more art on the wall and stuff um that it, it just works you know people can come in and use the computer um you know we do ask people you know we try to keep it to a you know a timed limit of, of a couple hours um per day per person um we we were kind of we were kind of really open with it um but but there, you know, people were kind of camping out on some of the computers and, you know, working on, on resumes, job searching, getting documents in order to be able to get your ID or, or things like that are always going to take precedent in the, in the computer lab. But we also don't want to be so, so uh, stringent or, or so kind of um, in the box where people can't get on Facebook and connect with loved ones or, or do things that they want to do, um, you know, every once in a while, you know, play a video game or, or what have you, um, as long as, as long as it's appropriate material um, that, that they're, they're working on or, or reading or looking at, um, I, we're okay with it, but, but what we, we don't want is, you know, somebody in there playing, playing a video game while somebody else might be needing to work on a resume, but we do have, you know, six, well, five now computers. Um, one, one broke the other day. Um, we'll get that fixed, but we do have five right now operating computers and, and then the printer there. And so um, printing is kind of limited. Um, uh, you know, you have to get permission from us to, to print something. So it's, it, we were having people that were just printing, um, you know books literal books um uh out of there and so uh we did have to kind of make some new policies and procedures and and how that works is you come in and say hey i, I want to use the computer lab um you check out a uh we have wireless keyboard and, and mice mouse i don't know how, <laughs> never knew the plural that if that's if it's still mice when it comes to the computer equipment or not but you will you'll check out uh your your, your mouse and your computer and your keyboard and, and somebody will kind of take you in there and run over the expectations of the room you know not having food or drink near the computers and and and, and the, the other policies of the room and you know being being cognizant that there's other people um, there and stuff like that, you know, being, being, you know, quiet and respectful and stuff like that. So, um, they'll go over that and, and then you'll check that back in or check, you know, check it out. Um, and, and we're, we'll just kind of go through and, you know, kind of like when you rent a car, you, you see what, what, what the car, what, what, what the, uh, condition was like when you, when you got it and then they kind of check it out when you get it. So we've, we've, we've kind of had to move to that just, just, just from some of the needs or some of the, the the behaviors and things that we were we were running into, so you check in and out of the computer lab, and sometimes that's maybe not why you're there. Maybe you just hey, you're working with a coach, and then we say hey, you know, would you like to work on your resume? And we might move over into the computer lab with an individual, and so we always have a computer uh, in the other in the other room there. That's kind of a quiet lounge, and then we have like these little. Uh, you know, like you might see in university libraries, these these uh, chairs that kind of have these really tall kind of walls that are a little bit more private um, and, and could more cushiony. And so people can sit there. Sometimes we have students. Uh, we're not far from many. <clears throat> sorry, many of the universities uh, and colleges here, whether it's Spalding or, or, or U of L or, or a couple of the other universities and colleges that are downtown here. Um, Simmons College is not far away, and so um, the seminaries are, are not far away either. And so, um, you know, people, students that are in recovery, or, or, or sometimes students that are volunteering, might come down and, and, and utilize that space and, and work on homework, or or just you know, people might do step work or anything in there. And so, yeah, we try to utilize that that space as much as possible. If someone needed help with like a job application or a resume, is there somebody on staff that could help them? Sorry, I know you're coughing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm doing my best today. Um, uh, you're doing great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Um, so, so people can go in there and utilize the computer lab, you know, with, by themselves. But oftentimes, um, yeah, that there there is multiple people on staff who can help them navigate. 
um, to, with the, you know, and kind of collaboratively do those things um, in the computer lab or, you know, in, in our private offices. But oftentimes that's, that's what will happen is we'll, we'll, we'll be collaborating with somebody and then, um, you know, oftentimes, hey, you know, somebody say, oh, well, I can, I can finish this or I can do that. Or uh, it might be like, hey, we got to this point. Do you think you can do this, you know, X, Y, and Z? And then like, we'll come back and and check over it before we submit it. How about that? And so being able to, you know, work collaboratively with them, but also give them some autonomy and, and empowerment to kind of do things on their own. So it's kind of a, you know, a, a, a back and forth volley, if you will, of, of kind of working collaboratively, but not doing everything for someone and, and allowing them to kind of, um, it, you know, have their have their autonomy there. All right. I didn't mean and to... I'm really jealous of those mailboxes. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to press ahead. I accidentally no, it's clicked. okay. No, I, 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 I was I, not meaning to shut you off at all. It's a great service. No, it's a great service. Un un unfortunately, early, early on, we realized that we didn't put nearly enough in. So uh, now our system is a file cabinet. Yeah, that's a facade. That looks really good. But for the 473 people that try to get mail at our place, it just ain't going to work. So we, we literally do alphabetically in a file cabinet, but looks good on a wall right now, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, it's been a great service for those that need that and are unstably housed. Well, you can't, you house. cannot, yeah, you cannot get a house or get in a house or uh, uh, be housed in Kentucky without a permanent address. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just, that's how that service started. Um, so you are, I can't remember the name of the suite, Sweet F. Yeah, Sweet F. Uh, 2516 Sweet F is where your, your uh, permanent address is. And I've taken people to get uh, surgery done. And, you know, that's the address they use when they're, you know, checking into the hospital. Um, so uh, it, 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 that's why I said I like uh, the uh, haircuts and the, um, clean start there because it, it's just kind of a, a nice little unique niche that they've yeah. got in the services that they provide. That's wonderful. And Jeremy at the LRCC, you have a number of um, supplies to keep individuals safe. I, it, I know the picture isn't clear. I'm not a photographer, but the fentanyl strips and the Narcan is, how do you go about them getting those supplies? Is there a process or you have those on your wall it's near a bathroom too yeah so i mean we do we do narcan and, and fentanyl test strip distribution and training of individuals um but we also um know that there's there's some people that that aren't going to go through the formal process or or actually ask or might be embarrassed or or things of that nature and so in the bathrooms um we do have you know we have sharps containers where people can get rid of, you know, any, any, any kind of hazardous material like that. Um, but we, we do just have the Narcan and the fentanyl test strips. And then in the, in, in the restrooms, we also have, you know, feminine, you know, hygiene products there as well for, for people to just use and take uh, as, as they see fit. And so we just, we do a little inventory each, each day or each evening and, and see what, what is, gone out and, and log that and, and kind of just in the bathrooms there as far as the Narcan and fentanyl test strips go. Um, people can take those at their leisure as they need them. Um, and then we also have a formal process, uh, you know, at the front desk or through our mobile units that that people can be trained and, and with, you know, in there, there's instructions on how to use those and, and, and th those two supplies um, that they're very easy, easy to use, and there's no harm. You know, that's the good thing about Narcan is, um, it, it if, if children or or people, you know, that that aren't suffering with opioid overdose, you know, ingest that or or, or you know get some of that uh, medicines in their system, it, it is not harmful to to it to anyone. Um, so that's so that's that's the beauty and being able to be able to give that out because there are people. That won't ask for it um 
or or feel embarrassed or you know with the condoms you know we have condoms in different places as well that people can just take at their leisure um just wanting people to be safe um in in what they do um we know these behaviors are going to happen in the community they do happen in the community and uh just just how can we increase safety and and, and increase access um and, and, and lower barriers that's great. That's great. And then also, I, when I was there, you you're talking about the flood damage, so I wasn't able to get a picture, you know, inside this room. But what do you use the kids zone for? Yeah, the kids zone uh, has kind of a multi multi purpose there. Um, so I know when I was in early, you know, when I was in early recovery in a new city, uh, I had I was a single parent. I had a uh, you know. Uh, infant child and uh, was taking my child to meetings and different places and um, and and it, I felt like it was a burden oftentimes or had this you know just I just always wished like hey man I, w I really wish there was some sort of you know you know I don't want to say child care because we don't do child care um, but if there was some sort of kids room or kids zone at these meetings to where other kids could play together or if 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 my my child was starting to cry in a meeting and and I wanted to go you know instead of going outside where there was lots of uh cigarettes uh <laughs> being smoked and things like that that tend to happen at, at the mutual aid meetings um uh, you know, I, I could I could go into this kid's room or or not feel like I was like walking through this church at, the, at you know, like look, going into a room that I wasn't supposed to go into or, or what have you. Um, and so that was part of that, uh, you know, is, is, hey, let's have a room where, A, if people are coming to get services and they have a child, maybe their child, you know, is a toddler or, or, or you know, a preteen or whatever, they can go in there. Uh, and 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 play around and have a space that's like theirs and is protected and um, there's an observation window on the other side. Um, so oftentimes individuals who need supervised visits, whether that's CPS or just uh, an agreement between um, you know partners, ex-partners, um, parents, co-parents, um, they can utilize. They can they can request that space for free. And so CPS is. Uh, utilize that a lot. The start teams utilize it a lot, um, and, and there's lots of attorneys now that have that, that know that that's there, and 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 will use that as well um, for supervised visits. And so, the parent and child can be in there and have their intimate time, and and the the supervisor can be on the outside. Um, we do have a camera in that area too, um, and so there is you know that is being recorded. Um, while they're in there and then they do have the observation window but then also during during those meetings kind of what i was speaking to kind of my personal um you know uh, the, the 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 part that was kind of personal to me uh, meetings that that take place there can can have a volunteer that says hey uh i'm going to volunteer to be in the kids room and and so when multiple you know kids come in for you know with their parents to the meeting they can be in there and, and have some fun time um and, and not be in the meeting or parents don't have to feel like they're you know having to give their kid their ipad or or, or more screen time i know that was my like i was always breaking my screen time boundaries with my son at meetings because i was like ah Yep, you're going to get an hour of screen time now because um, I want you to be still and in, in, in the in the meeting and, and so I can be present and uh, so that that's that's kind of the, the the multi purposes of the kids zone there and when we have community you know meetings or other community organizations that have uh, you know have space or or hold space there. Um, they'll have volunteers that that utilize it for the same reasons and, and kids can go in there and run around and have fun and so there's there's all kinds of toys there's books there's there's baby dolls there's pack and plays there's uh, bottle warmers there's a rocking chair um, and there's you know space there in the middle where where kids can run around and play great great thank you um, and at the neighborhood you have the drop youth center, which is really cool. And it, yep. it's in partnership with pathways runs it right. Right. And they use that Taylor program. And there's, there's a couple dozen uh, of those centers throughout the state of Kentucky. And that's, this is also the same place that had the pool table. Um, 
I strategically go to this place last when anytime we do a tour because it's my favorite. Uh, it's it's the one that has all the cool stuff, you know, the, the but, but, but despite cool, it's also just effective. So they are actually doing cooking classes in that kitchenette. Um, even if it's something as simple as mac and cheese that you microwave or give me some ramen noodles, like on top of the stove, they're doing si simplicity, but over time, simplicity adds up. Uh, and simplicity can make a, a lasting difference. And so uh, it's just purpose, purpose spaces. And I, listen, I, we were sitting here, I was on mute because I'm telling them how jealous I am because I'm a parent of an adopted child. And through the fostering process, uh, I mean, my four-year-old or my four-year-old was born addicted to heroin. And we, we went through a lot of process in, in his healing. And a lot of the time there was some supervised uh, time with, with his parents, with his biological parents. And there weren't good options in my town for that. And so I envy that. We've had that discussion over the last couple of years. Like, I want to build a living room in our space, just a living room for the purpose of living uh, so that there could be some comfortable interactions uh, with families for multiple reasons. But man, I'm, I, I was sitting here, I'm clapping my hands just for that kid zone for, for the multiple purposes. But yeah, this is the drop you center. Sorry, got on a tangent there, but I'm proud of you guys for real. Uh, but this, this works really well with Pathways in the Taylor program for sure. And they have um, counselors, caseworkers. Um, you know, they've got eight, a room of eight computers, again, for that very purpose. Uh, to get kids a job and to yep. get them even homework after school, you know, after school homework, helping and tutoring um, is just very helpful. And I, I just kind of jump in here too on this. It's something that hit when I took over. Um, everybody had, it looked like a jailer with like 60 keys. <laughs> so we went to a master, master lock system. So all the directors have, they can key in anywhere. Uh, the employees can key into the, the building and into uh, yeah. their their assigned spaces. But at night, like the drops open later than anybody else. So they get a kid that comes in and needs a tennis shoes or needs food or whatever. They just go key into the other agencies, take what they need and leave a note saying, hey, tomorrow put this on charity tracker that we, we got a size eight tennis shoes or whatever. So uh, uh, again, it, uh, it was kind of crazy. And we were incredibly siloed six, eight years ago, you know? So that's another thing. If you get a center like this, you know, do a master key system. So, uh, it can flow, you know? Um, right. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. So I just wanted to talk about, um, Jeremy, your vans that you offer, your mobile vans. You've got the one that's called the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition. And what are they? Um, do? Yeah, so, so the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition is, um, they're, they're a nonprofit that is kind of embedded within the LRCC now. They rent office spaces off of us. Um, and they they do a lot of Narcan training, a lot of Narcan distribution. They work with an organization we work with. I'm on their board of directors, um, proud to be on their board of directors. And uh, we we work with an uh, organization uh, out of New York City that's called Next Distro, and and they uh, mail distribute um, harm reduction supplies all over the nation, and they work with with states or partners in states. So when people go to Next Distro and they're from Kentucky, they will then send them to us at the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition. And, and throughout the state of Kentucky, we can distribute Narcan and fentanyl test strips to agencies, individuals, um, anyone that that um, really wants to to have that that service kind of um, you know, delivered to them, we can, we can, we can do that through mail, but we do have with LRCC, I have a partnership with them with a MOUD expansion. Um, and so what that looks like is we, we partnered up with um, Dr. Christopher Stewart from U of L um, psychiatric department um, who has his X license or X waiver to be able to um, he's also an, an addictionologist and runs an IOP and, and program over there at U of L. And so he'll come out with us um, a couple times a week. Um, and when he's not with us, we, we have telehealth components to where there's a peer support specialist 
um, or actually two peer support specialists that go out with the unit, whether that's at the syringe exchange or into the homeless encampments. And we can, uh, you know, utilize telehealth to get them in with Dr. Stewart. We're, we're bringing some other doctors on now as this kind of expands. Um, getting it up and going was was a little bit of a challenge with contracts and things of that nature. But but the idea was to expand access to medications for opioid use disorder and really expand access to, you know, to just having health care or a health care provider um, was part of that or having psychiatric meds because we are seeing, I think it's always been there. There, but we're seeing even more, um, uh, you know, co-occurring disorders. People um, are, are 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 being diagnosed, or, or we're seeing a, a, a lot of of mental health crisis or, or issues along with substance use. And oftentimes, we know people are are self-medicating, and so just just having a physician and having the right people there at, at our side or, or one click away is very important. So, um, and we do know that a lot of times individuals at the syringe exchange, um, they're a lot of times their first shift to treatment is, is going to be, um, you know, not always going to be in the abstinence based um, treatment um, or, or, or go straight to detox. Um, and in detox, a lot of times they, they want to, you um, start off with medications um, and kind of and, and that's part of their their journey and so being able to be there at the at the exchanges when people are ready to move into that stage of their recovery um, is 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 wonderful to be able to do that and then we have another mobile unit yep. called our more unit that is in conjunction with um, voices of hope there in Lexington um, and so um, that's something that we we wrote for together and um, you know, we both have unit, there's a unit in Lexington, uh, and a unit here in Louisville, and we go out into the community and we, we just engage, engage, engage. And so that looks like going to the encampments. It looks like going, setting up in parking lots and, um, you know, oftentimes now partners, uh, other agencies, uh, want to come along with and where are you going to be next week? And now we have like set different days where there's organizations that'll come out and provide the food and we'll grill out in the middle of a neighborhood. We'll set up shop and grill out and play some music and people will come over and we're engaged with the community and be able to give out, you know, supplies. We have, we have a lot of different supplies, um, harm reduction supplies, whether that's, you know, safe, safer smoking kits or safer injection kits or, or, you know, the fentanyl test strips, but also the, the underwear, the food, um, you know, snacks, um, wound care, you know, bug spray for people that are living uh, in the encampments, sunscreen, um, just what, you know, we, we add to our list of things that we keep on the mobile unit, just, um, you know, it seems like every month, just because somebody will ask, like, do you have you know, you know, like bug spray. Do you have bug spray? Like, no, we, we, we don't have bug spray, but you live outside. You need bug spray. Huh? Well, we didn't think of that, you know, because we don't live outside or it's been a while since I've lived outside. And so thank you for that. We will get, we will get you bug spray um, or, 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 or repel like wipes to where you can wipe your whole body down um, or dog food, cat food, right? People have companions and, and those companions are, might be the only thing in, in life that these individuals trust, or, you know, might be the only thing they deem that doesn't judge them. And like these companions, these, these animals that people have in the encampments are very, very, very important to them. Just like just like Lulu, my dog is important to me. Um, and so being able to feed their dog or the cat is, is important as well. And so being able to get those types of items to people is very important. And that's, that builds the, that relationship. And, and we see oftentimes being able to, you know, be able to get folks from, you know, an encampment to our brick and mortar or, you know, part of the other mobile unit is there's a peer navigator position, um, where an individual can drive their own car we have you know insurance built for that where individuals will um you know if they need a ride to the pharmacy or to their doctor appointment or to maybe to the lrcc or to maybe a job interview or anywhere like that 
we can we can be able to a we got bus passes that we're able to give them if if they want to utilize that but we can also get you there um because sometimes you know the bus isn't always efficient um public transportation isn't always efficient and so being able to get people there and get people there on time or knowing like hey we've given this person bus passes before um and and they still weren't making it so there was something there so hey you think you think you'd be willing to go to the appointment if we like came and picked you up like right here um and so being able to do that uh helps eliminate barriers too and and but but we got to build that trust and so going out into these communities and and helping increase access um and and, and eliminating barriers is kind of what the mobile units are all about we know that there's you know especially in louisville um there's been a lot of neighborhoods that have have been uh kind of oppressed and, and kind of left out um, especially across the ninth street ninth street divide there in louisville in the west end of louisville um trying to just um let people know that we're here that we care and and that um that that we want to you know see other services um you know being offered there in that community that aren't traditionally or haven't historically been been offered in that area and so we're seeing a lot more um agencies coming together to 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 come uh with these same type of efforts and so it's beautiful to see the community kind of come together for that reason that's great meeting the client where they are um we also have on this call um Client or um, two individuals, Mary and Charles, that work with the Hope Mobile. Are you still on this call, Mary and Charles? They were going to talk a little bit about in Lexington. They have the Hope Mobile outreach program that they um, travel to different places in the downtown Lexington area. They may have um, not been able to stay on the call, but again, um, just to let those on that are still here that this is a service that they provide in Lexington and they go out and meet those that are unstably housed they have resource guides where to get food and where to get um, a lot of referrals for medical treatment and things like that so it's a great um, organization that's doing a lot of good work in the Lexington community we are out of time, so I'm not able to finish up with questions, but I, what I will do is um, have um, the Jeremy, Jeremy, and Todd um, try to answer those questions, and I'll send them out in uh, email, or I also put in a collaboration space that I can at least address those questions. So I was hoping to get to all of them. This was great. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, Jeremy and Todd for your time. And this was information was so great to hear. And I could see the comments in the chat box. People really do appreciate that. Um, thank you. Um, just a reminder about educate certificate of education. If you are needing a certificate of education or you're a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, you can click on or visit this website and yeah, Liz just put it in the chat box or you can scan the QR code. Um, and this will allow you to get a certificate of uh, attendance or um, the credit if you're a licensed alcohol and drug uh, counselor, I'll send that out to you. If you're looking for CE credits, um, you will if you go to this website, CE Central, get credit and go ahead and enter that activity code. Uh, so Liz has put that in the chat box and then you will be able to get your certificate. If this is the first time you're using the registration for CE Central, you do have to register, but it's, it's like under a minute. It's real brief and it's very, very quick. And we would like your feedback from this session and what do you wanna see in future sessions? So if you wouldn't mind filling out this um, evaluation survey, um, it takes, again, less than a minute to complete, but we really do value your input. And just to let you know what's coming up on the horizon, for June, we'll have an on-demand video, very different, um, but it is geared towards attorney and judges for CLE credit, but it's going to be opened up to our whole state, not just our Wave 1 counties. And, um, and anyone can watch the video, but it is going to be geared towards um, the legal system and opioid epidemic, the evidence-based approaches, uh, civil liability and criminal liability with carrying naloxone, as well.
well as the FDA approved medication. So we have two attorneys, a physician and a pharmacist presenting and it's, um, we've just got done with the taping and recording and it's really gonna be very um, interesting and great uh, session. So I hope you're able to at least view that. And then in July, we're gonna have the Narcan vending machines and we'll have a speaker from Nevada coming in who implemented those um, successfully in her community. Kentucky Open is every Thursday and hope you can, um, there's a link in the chat box to visit um, and register. And, um, and then there's just the financial disclosure. No one wants to read, but I have to present it here. Thank you all for being here. I'm sorry we went a few minutes over. Um, and thank you again to our panelists who did a fabulous job in showcasing their center. So impressive. And we hope that maybe, um, I know with your information, maybe that will get up the people in this room started in their own communities, ways to start their own centers. So thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Do you need anything? I was going to no, stay. I was just going to no, stay no. on Thank in case so anybody needed anything. One yeah. of the ads. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank Good. you. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. I hope See you get you better. Feel better. Thanks.